Hi there, I'm Kathleen Jasper, and today I'm gonna to be talking to you about an amazing strategy I used almost every single day in my classroom called Read Aloud, Think Aloud, and it helps with metacognition, understanding complex concepts, and reading informational text that has academic heavy vocabulary. Let's get started. All right, so one of my favorite activities is read aloud, think aloud, and I used it almost every single day as an English teacher, reading teacher, and science teacher. And one of the ways in which read aloud, think aloud works is that as you read, you think aloud and you show students your process of thinking, which is metacognition, and it shows students how to navigate complex text, complex vocabulary, and have a better understanding. It also chunks larger pieces of text so that it's not as overwhelming and students can understand the reading better. All right. Now there are a couple things that I do before I start my read aloud, think aloud, just so you know, to make it go smoother. First thing I do is I get a list of readers before I start the reading. Why? Because I'm sure you've been there and you're like, okay, who wants to read next? And you're looking, <laughs> and nobody's raising their hand and you're like, come on guys, somebody read for me. And you're like begging people to read. I don't do that. Instead, I just have a sticky note next to my book. And I say, all right guys, who wants to read today uh, for section one? And one or two kids will raise their hand. And so I'll write their names down on the piece of paper. As you do more and more read aloud, think alouds, and students feel that it's a safe environment to read aloud, you will get more students to read aloud and add their names to that list. So at first you might just get one or two, but as you do this more and more, kids will be begging to read. One thing I recommend is to not do round robin reading where this kid reads, then this kid reads, then this kid reads based on where they are sitting. It's bad practice and it is um, something that we wanna stay away from for two reasons I'll quickly go over. Number one, it is anxiety inducing for students who do not like to read aloud. Some kids do not wanna read aloud in class and guess what, that's okay. They don't have to and you shouldn't make them. I will stand by that statement a hundred times, okay? If a kid does not wanna read aloud in front of his or her peers, don't make him or her do that, okay? Once that student sees that it's a safe place to read aloud, he or she may raise a hand and say, you know what, I do wanna to read today. But until then, do not make students read. The second reason why round robin reading is a bad practice is because typically, and this is what I used to do when I was a kid, let's say I was the fourth kid in the row, I would count to the fourth paragraph and just read that paragraph over and over again until I basically memorized it so I wouldn't make any mistakes when it was my turn to read. Well, what does that do? It defeats the purpose of the read aloud because now I haven't read anything else except my paragraph. I haven't been paying attention to what's been going on in the classroom and I'm only focused on my paragraph because I'm so freaked out about reading aloud. So that is why round robin reading is bad practice and I highly recommend you ditch it if you've been using it. I understand it was used when we were kids and some of you may be using it now, but look at the research. It says, get rid of it and I recommend this method instead. All right, so I say, hey guys, who wants to read today? We're in section one of our book on page seven. Let's take a look at this. Anybody wanna read about uh, matter? We're gonna be talking about matter today. And I got three or four kids on my sticky note. I write them down. I say, okay, great. Now, before we get reading, I'm gonna do a little bit of build up here, all right? So, all right, so let's take a look at the standard here. And you can see for this textbook that I got from a California district, their standards are in the textbook and it will typically be that way for most textbook. You may have the standard or the objective on your board. Either way, let's discuss the objective of the reading first. All right, guys, by the end of this reading, you will know that compounds are formed by combining two or more different elements and that compounds have properties that are different from their constituent elements. And they may be like, huh? And I would say that sounds a little confusing right now, but what we're gonna be talking about is matter. We're gonna understand what makes matter matter. And then we're gonna talk more in depth about compounds and elements and things like that. And they may say, okay, whatever. 
And then here, which I really like, are three guiding questions. You will have these in most textbooks. What I like to do with my students is have them write those questions down. And as we read, we say, hey, did we answer any of these questions yet? They go back and they say, yeah. And then they write the answer to those questions. It's just another way to think critically about the reading and to keep them engaged. So there's a little reading, there's a little writing, there's a little uh, visual elements to it. So it kind of brings in everything. And then the next thing I might do is pre-teach some of this vocabulary before we start reading. Now you can do this as explicitly as you would like. We could turn these key terms here into a word wall where we're really interacting with this. We could just simply talk about them. We could have a look at them and maybe say, okay, these are the key terms. Any words in there that you know or that you've thought of before? And someone might say, well, I know what an element is. And I might say, okay, what's an element? Well, it's on the periodic table. Things like carbon, things like hydrogen, those are elements. And I might say, very good, yeah, take a look. Periodic table, those are the elements. Someone else may say matter or molecule. We may just kind of casually talk about these because they are in the reading and then we may stop to discuss them more. Or you may want to explicitly pre-teach the vocabulary. That's totally fine too. Um, it just depends on what you'd like, okay? I would probably have a discussion and teach them in context as we read, number one, because it's easier, and number two, it just helps to for them to understand them better, all right? All right, and now you may have this like standards warm up here. You might do this activity with your students, or you might just say, all right, guys, let's do a quick little KWL, little background knowledge. How many of you know what matter is? And someone may raise his or her hand. I know what matter is. What is it? And they may say, and you say, okay, great. Anybody else understand matter? What's going on? What about molecules? Can we talk about molecules? And we may just start, get the juices going, little uh, brainstorm. I might show a video to pre-teach some of this stuff, get the background knowledge going. Or we might just jump right into the reading and just go and, and teach along the way. It just depends on what you want to do, all right? All right, so now I'm going to start the read aloud, think aloud. And I'm going to start as the teacher because I'm going to model the way I want my students to read aloud, think aloud, all right? So here we go. I'm going to start right here on this paragraph here. All right, guys, here we go. You have probably heard the word matter many times. Think about how often you hear phrases, as a matter of fact, or, hey, what's the matter? In science, this word has a specific meaning. Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. All right, I might stop. It's all right. That's one of our first key terms there. Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. Now, we might have to review what mass is, but generally, you could look around the room and just talk about objects. Hold up an object that has matter, and a kid might hold up um, his or her water bottle. And you might say, okay, which part of that is matter? And the kid might say, well, the plastic and the water in it. And I might say, absolutely, liquid is matter. So is plastic. I might say, what about the gases around us that we're breathing? Is that matter? And they may say, yes. And I would say, yes, it has mass and it takes up space. So it's matter. All right, let's keep going. All the stuff around you is matter and you are matter too. Air, plastic, metal, wood, glass, paper, and cloth, all of these are matter, all right? So we can see here at the bottom, there is a like a cooking situation going on there. You might wanna relate it to cooking because that's an everyday thing. Um, but you can see we have ceramic, wood, metal, foam. These are all types of matter and they're all here. Everything around us has matter or is matter, I should say. Okay, so let's go to the next one here. And I might do one more paragraph before I switch it over to my students. All right, guys, we're moving on to the properties of matter. And I think that's linked into one of our guiding questions. Let's just go back. What kinds of properties are used to describe matter? All right, let's be on the lookout and let's keep our ears open for maybe an answer to this first question. All right, here we go, guys, properties of matter. Even though air and plastic are both matter, no one has to tell you they are different materials. Matter can have many different properties or characteristics. Okay, so that goes along with what we're talking about in that guiding question. So let's be on the lookout. Materials can be hard or soft, rough or smooth, hot or cold, liquid, solid, or gas. And I might stop there and say, liquid, solid, or gas. Does that ring a bell to any of you guys? and someone might raise his or her hand, yes, matter is either a liquid, solid, or gas, and another kid might say, or plasma, and then you might have a discussion about that, 
And you may say, yes, liquid, solid, and gas are the three main states of matter. Some materials catch fire easily, but others do not burn. Chemistry is the study of properties of matter and how matter changes. And I might say, hmm, what catches fire easily? And the kids might say paper or, or wood or something like that. And I might say, what is a substance that doesn't burn? And someone might say concrete or cement. So um, that would be a really good way to get that discussion going about the different properties and how they uh, are different, right? And so I might go back to that guiding question and say, all right, let's talk about this guiding question. What kinds of properties are used to describe matter? And we might say hard, soft, solid, liquid, gas, whether something burns, whether something doesn't burn. Notice that we just answered our first question really good, guys. All right. Now let's go to our next reader. All right, Sam, thank you for volunteering. Why don't you start with the next paragraph? So Sam starts and Sam says, the properties and changes of any type of matter depend on its makeup. Some types of matter are sub... Sub substances and some are not. All right, just want to bring this to your attention. Notice that Sam struggled with the word substance. You do not want to jump in as a reading teacher while the student is a reading aloud and correct every little mistake the student is making. Allow the students to struggle a little bit with it. And if the student still can't get it, you may want to say, hey, you want some help with that word? And he may say yes. And so you go ahead and help him or her out with the word, okay? Don't jump in and correct every little problem the student is having. Otherwise, the student's not going to want to read aloud again, all right? Um, all right. In chemistry, a substance is a single kind of matter that is pure, meaning it always has a specific makeup or composition and a specific set of properties. Okay, Sam, I'm going to stop you there. Thank you. We're going to keep reading, but I just want to talk about this substance that is pure. Let's talk about that really quickly, guys. It says, meaning it always has a specific makeup or composition. Have you ever heard the term pure used in conversation or in a book? And someone might say, yeah, it means like it's really special or it's just one thing. It doesn't have a lot of other things kind of mucking it up. They may, you know, talk about that. Okay, good. Let's keep reading. For example, table salt has the same composition of properties no matter where it comes from. Seawater or a salt mine, it's always salt. On the other hand, think about the batter for blueberry muffins. It contains flour, butter, sugar, salt, blueberries, and other ingredients. While some of the ingredients such as sugar and salt are pure substances, the muffin batter is not. It consists of several ingredients that can vary with the recipe. All right, Sam, thank you so much for reading. Let's just discuss this a little bit more. So we have salt, and it says that it's a pure substance. Is salt on our periodic table? And I might have a big periodic table behind me because I know we're talking about elements and substances. And they may say yes, and we, we may point to it on the periodic table. And I may say, okay, is blueberry muffin batter on the periodic table? <laughs> And the kids may say, no, of course not. So that's one way of uh, talking about that. And then we get into this guiding question here. Every form of matter has two kinds of properties, physical properties and chemical properties. All right. So we may add that to what we already said. We said properties of matter are soft, hard, liquid, solid, gas. And then now we're going to get into physical properties versus chemical properties. And it'll answer some more questions. All right. So we do that over and over again with the students. We talk about some of the pictures. I pull up some stuff online. We discuss the different words. Maybe we go back and answer some questions. And before you know it, you know, we're already here and uh, maybe we're on elements and this is where we stop for the day. All right. We've read a few paragraphs. We've gotten through a bunch of stuff. We didn't make it through the whole section. That's okay because we've really dug in and understood this. And what I would then do is go back to the objective, see if we met our objectives for the day. Now, this standard right here, we probably didn't meet this standard yet, but your objectives for the day might be something 
you know, a little bit more tangible for this particular reading, right? You're going to have the overarching standard, which is kind of big, but then you're going to have objectives underneath that standard. So maybe the objective was students will understand properties of matter and students will understand what a substance is. And I can say, all right, guys, did we meet those objectives? And they might say yes. And then we might have a discussion and that might be it for science class that day. All right. Or Maybe now we have time for a little group activity or a little individual activity. Maybe you have a worksheet or something you want them to write down, whatever it is, but they can finish it in class that day. It does not have to be a huge assignment that you grade. It does not have to be a homework assignment that they take home that takes hours and hours. We just want to make sure that they understand the objectives, that they're moving towards mastery of that standard, and they got a lot of really good content knowledge today. Our activity today did several things. Number one, we did a reading activity and we helped them read in science, which helps them with their informational text reading, helps them with their content area vocabulary or their tier three vocabulary, and it helps them become more, um, more comfortable reading aloud and moving through their reading with automaticity. So you really hit some reading standards today with this science instruction. The second thing we did was we really took a deep dive and did a read aloud, think aloud, where we worked on metacognition, where we help students think about their thinking, which helps them to work that out in other content areas like social science and math and all the other content areas. You're showing them how to use their brain, how to think aloud, and we're modeling that with the students. We also did some background knowledge work. We pre-taught some vocabulary, we asked some questions, we answered some questions as we read, and we did something that is relevant and authentic to their lives because we're talking about pancake batter and substances like table salt and how matter is all around us, and we brought science into the real world. So this small little activity really hit a lot of things that students need in order to become proficient in the standard that we're talking about there. And if I were an assistant principal and I saw you do this activity, I would definitely give you a thumbs up because you not only have student engagement, but you are hitting a bunch of other areas all at one. Now I'll tell you one more thing about read aloud, think aloud that surprised me. So I did this activity almost every single day in the classroom. It was not the whole class, but we would do it at least once a day. We would read in science and usually it was done this way. At the end of the year, I surveyed my high school students. So these guys were in high school. They were in 10th grade biology. And I asked them what their favorite activities were. And I had them listed all the different things that we did. So I had read aloud, think aloud. I had group work. I had labs and anything else that we did, writing uh, projects, things like that. The number one winner was read aloud, think aloud, which I was shocked. I thought for sure they would choose labs or group work. But when I had them explain why, I always put a little box under why, and you should definitely survey your students throughout the year to see what's working with them and what's not. They said that they learned a lot and they felt more comfortable and ready for the end of the year exam in science. So even the kids like to read aloud, think aloud. I, of course, thought it was super effective. I liked it. I like to use it. And um, it helped me kind of you know, it's, it's, a, it's an activity that takes a long time and not a lot of planning. And once you become used to it, you can do it on the fly. So I liked it for sure, but my students really liked it as well. And so that's really, really important. And I'll tell you when done properly, this can really help to engage your students and help them become better readers of informational text. All right, so that's it for today. I hope that you learned something from our Read Aloud, Think Aloud activity, and I hope you can apply this in your classroom as well, no matter what content area you teach. Please let us know in the comments how you're doing, and if you have any other things you would like me to film, consider giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing to our YouTube channel. I've also linked up a bunch of other videos that have to do with this, like planning and also objectives and things like that, so make sure you check those out. Those are all linked up here and in the description below. Have a great day. Thank you so much for watching. We have a ton of videos on my YouTube channel. Please consider subscribing and following me on my social media networks at Kathleen Jasper. Have a great day.